Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your participation in the uh, events organized by the EU Center of Korean University. My name is Song Park, professor at the uh, Korean School of International Studies and College of International Studies. And uh, at the same time, I'm serving the executive director of the EU Center at Korean University, which is called Jangmone EU Center of Excellence, uh, which was awarded by the European uh, Union. I'm really very happy to uh, moderate this uh, Ambassador's Roundtable. Um, you know, May 9th uh, has a kind of double meanings. May 9th is uh, Europe Day, which is celebrating uh, the very uh, famous speech given by Robert Schumann in 1950, uh, which was uh, uh, which was uh, uh, setting the foundation for the European integration by establishing the European Korean Steel Community. But we have learned quite recently that uh, May 9th is also Victory Day for Russia, right? Uh, so that uh, we have uh, uh, been having a kind of uh, conflicting signals from uh, the uh, Europe Day and the Victory Day uh, for uh, Russia. The uh, European Union recently has been facing a number of uh, crises. Uh, COVID-19 is uh, still ongoing, uh, which is fading out, uh, so that it's a kind of a very good sign. Uh, but we have got uh, the changing geopolitics uh, in Europe uh, due to the uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine. And uh, there is uh, what uh, I thought uh, is a very good opportunity for uh, the students at Korean University to have uh, interactions and discussions with uh, ambassadors. I'm really very happy to have uh, three ambassadors, and actually four ambassadors uh, in this room. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, the ambassadors. Um, her Excellency Maria Castillo Fernandez, a long-lasting friend of uh, Korea University and also a personal friend of mine and Professor Lee. Um, we have uh, been uh, working quite a lot, uh, especially in her first location and position in uh, Europe, uh, in Korea. And uh, secondly, uh, we have uh, uh, Ambassador Ota from Georgia. Uh, Georgia is not a member of the European Union yet, but uh, the country is aspiring to become. Uh, and also, Georgia is uh, kind of uh, indirectly or directly, he will uh, declare, he will clarify that. Um, Fear, uh, kind of uh, pressed by the, the changing geopolitics in Europe as well. And also, we have a uh, kind of immediate neighbor to uh, this uh, uh, crisis, uh, Latvia. So, uh, Ambassador Aris, uh, we have invited um, to have uh, this uh, round table. And another ambassador you cannot find easily, but uh, we have here Professor Ho, Ho Sin Cho. Ho Sin Cho is uh, uh, formerly uh, ambassador of Korea to Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, he probably uh, will intervene whenever uh, there is uh, some question about the Ukraine and Korea's perspective. And uh, the final panelist I'd like to uh, introduce is uh, especially my neighbor. I mean, we are talking about the European neighborhood policy. Uh, my immediate neighbor in uh, terms of office, he's uh, 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 sitting uh, in the uh, next room, next door. And uh, Professor Lee Desun, a general uh, chair and uh, expert on European politics. So uh, we have uh, teamed up like that, and I think uh, uh, without further ado, 
I'd like to start the discussion. First of all, I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Maria to uh, present about the European labor policy and also changing politics and geopolitics in Europe. What is your perspective, Maria? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Park, Professor Lee, Ambassadors, Professor Lin, uh, students. Uh, I'm very happy to, to come back to Korea University. I haven't come back since I came back, uh, so long overdue. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, uh, I was uh, working very closely with uh, both Professor Park and Professor Lee. Uh, um, for many years, and we created a uh, thing together, this uh, EU Jamone Center, uh, many years ago. So I'm happy after, you know, 12, 15 years to come back and, and, and see uh, something we have contributed together, still operating and enlarging, and uh, the students like you benefiting from uh, a lot of knowledge about Europe uh, in, 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 this, in, in this house. So, you want to know what Europe comes to Korea University, they, they are the ones who know what, what Europe is about and, 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 and uh, uh, teach all of you uh, um, about uh, Europe. Europe becomes more important now than ever, you know, there is much more interest for, for us in this part of the world, in Korea. Um, unfortunately, for because of our, of, of our war, uh, and just before the war in, 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 in Ukraine and in Europe, and with implications around the world. Would you permit me to take out uh, to speak? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> um, so I, uh, you know, I, I was going to, to to focus too much on the European, what is the ENP, the European Neighborhood Policy, but I thought it was more perhaps relevant also to, to tell you a little bit about what is, what has, change, or the big change that has come through since uh, February 24th in, in, in Europe and in, in the world, um, and also in this part. And uh, we started, uh, you know, with this European neighborhood policy also uh, in, in 2004, um, mainly uh, because um, we had seen major changes in, uh, in the neighborhood of Europe, in the south neighborhood you had in 2001 the Arab Spring, you know, and in the East you had also some uh, revolutions uh, in different countries, uh, but also, you know, uh, conflicts uh, in Russian-backed uh, separatist uh, parts and regions of these countries, and therefore uh, there was a need to, to at least support uh, the stability, the prosperity of countries who voluntarily choose to, to be also, uh, or, or come closer to Europe. And that was the idea not, uh, you know, to, to make it as a gateway to membership, but to create closer partnerships uh, with, with countries. And at the beginning there were six countries, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, in the east part. And then you had the southern Mediterranean, uh, northern Mediterranean countries. Uh, let me focus today, of course, on the eastern part, because this is what is at stake um, here. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the, the full invasion, unjustified and unprovoked invasion of, of Ukraine to, of Russia to Ukraine, so of course, has completely changed uh, the, the political uh, and geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, scenery in Europe and, and around the world. Uh, but uh, um, it started uh, in 2008 in Georgia uh, with the crisis in Georgia. Um, that was the first, uh, you know, uh, this is not something that comes uh, in February. It comes from that time, and I imagine the ambassador of Georgia will tell you more, more than ever. But uh, the, the, the uh, European uh, policy towards our eastern neighborhood uh, became more, more relevant. What we were trying to do is trying to support a stronger economy of these countries, stronger governance, governance is key, uh, it means long-lasting institutions, a stronger connectivity, you need to, you know, to start economic development, you need to connect, you need to facilitate connectivity, 
and stronger society, a civil society, rule of law, uh, you know, democratic institutions, uh, institution capacity building. These are key pillars of what we have tried to do to bring um, um, countries closer to Europe in our neighborhood, but also to make them more stronger, more prosperous, more, more ready to be able to confront internal conflicts and also external uh, shocks. So this is, this is very, very important. Results have been mixed over the years. Uh, in some countries, we see Belarus, certainly not a country that uh, um, complies with uh, human rights, uh, freedoms, uh, democratic principles. So Belarus has been suspended from this uh, partnership. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, others it has been more difficult to move ahead, but uh, we have been consistent and continue to, to, to proceed this, this support. Uh, what is important uh, is that this is a long-term strategy. You cannot, even if it started 2004, and it has been already, I would say, nearly 20 years, it is a long-term process. You don't change country societies uh, um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a quick uh, way. Uh, you need to make it stable, you need to make it durable, and that is, is, is difficult. And that's why we have, what we have slowly been created is very close agreements uh, with uh, countries like Georgia, like uh, Moldova, like uh, Ukraine. Um, but uh, now, you know, the panorama is a bit uh, changing uh, with uh, this uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine. And uh, in February, both Ukraine, uh, Georgia and Moldova applied to become members of the European Union. Uh, um, this is uh, uh, in the midst of a very big political security crisis. So leaders of Europe, you know, in, in, when there is one of these big crises, they take responsibility. Then the, the, the question becomes a political one. It is for your leaders to, to, to decide, you know, what should we do? How do we respond to this, to this demand? And, um, you know, um, the one is the process, one is the political in intentions. Uh, let me say that uh, um, we have reacted very quickly in Versailles. EU leaders uh, decided that they will certainly uh, uh, accelerate the process uh, for this um, uh, membership. Uh, you have to also comply with the, with the treaties and, and, uh, and the laws. And a country must be ready politically, economically, because you cannot push them into into the European Union if you are not ready, because then the, the, the country cannot be able to, you know, uh, um, comply with obligations, because to be a member of the European Union has obligations and advantage, but also a lot of obligations. And you need to prepare, that's why all the process for preparation comes into, into play. But uh, we have, I think that they have been, uh, the start of this process has been uh, accelerated, um, Certainly, uh, the European leaders have uh, tasked the Commission to come with an opinion. For that, uh, we produced a questionnaire, and I, I think it was yesterday uh, when we were celebrating Europe Day. I think uh, the Ukrainian president uh, provided uh, uh, the, the, the more than 5,000 pages of, of replies to this questionnaire, uh, so that it will be analyzed, and then the, com the Commission will be will give an opinion. They will say this country is ready or not for, to be a candidate a country. And that then starts a process where we negotiate, and, and I think Latvia ambassador will tell you a little bit more about the, the, the process of negotiation because they are countries which went through that process. Uh, for Spain, it took more than 12 years. Uh, we were also coming out from dictatorship. It was politically important to be part of the European Union. Uh, but it took us uh, more than 12 years to, to, to negotiate and to get ready to that. So it is, it is a process uh, uh, that will be uh, long, but it will certainly, you know, there is a, a political si sign that, uh, and it has been given that both uh, 
Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia are part of the European family. Uh, their, their security is our security, that we want them with us. And I think I can uh, uh, mention, the, you know, uh, the, the words that were said by uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, um, yes, uh, Tuesday, when we were, Monday, we were celebrating Europe Day. Uh, she said that um, we are, and there was a big discussion in Europe about the future in Europe. I don't know if some, if some of you follow it. Uh, uh, there was a whole one year discussion in European Parliament about what would be the future, how we can, we need to change, so where we need to focus with a very big um, group of, of, you know, it has been discussions, panelists, conference has been taking place for more than two years on this. And they gave the report to the to the leaders of uh, Europe, uh, President Macron uh, and the European Parliament uh, President. And then she said, uh, we, are, we have to write the next stage, the next stage of Europe. The European Union is a peace project. That is, that is what we are. We are not an economic project. We are a peace project. And then she said, and then the next page will have to be written with you, with Ukrainian friends, with Moldova, with uh, Georgia, with the uh, new candidate countries. We need to write the next page with you. You will be part of the, of, of the future together. And I think that is uh, where I want to leave it. It is, uh, it is a process. Uh, we are all here to respect the law uh, because we want, and that's what the Ukrainians are fighting for, for the international order to be respected. And, 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 and that is what we, we, we it is a stake. The war in Ukraine means uh, a war against international principles. Um, do you respect international principles or do you want to push them by force and by invasion? If that is the case, then, you know, the fundamental principles were countries, all countries in the world, because this is about the United Nations Charter. This is about the OSCE. You know what the OSCE is? The Organization for Security in Europe, which was the basis of, of where, you know, countries agreed uh, on security, how will be the security in Europe after two world wars. So these principles don't mean anything anymore. Uh, and that means that in any part of the world here as well, a big country can decide uh, to take a small country uh, because you are part of my zone of influence, or so I want to control you, and I want you to decide, want me to decide what you are going to to do. This is not in more politics uh, of the 21st century. So we are here to defend our our, our, our principles, uh, the laws, and and. and and the, the norms that we have all uh, agreed, the fundamental values that we all have agreed. So that's why this, this unjustified invasion is important for all of us. Uh, also for this part of the world, there will have enormous implications. There will be a big energy crisis, we will have a food crisis, we will have uh, problems with supply chains, uh, problems with, uh, with logistics, but uh, it's, it's our own our own rights at stake. I don't mind paying more for my electricity bill in Spain, which I tell you is very high, but I know I do it for them. There are people today which are fighting for our freedom. And I think we don't need to forget that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> yes, uh, all the problems uh, she mentioned, uh, we are feeling today uh, already. Uh, next of all, I'd like to invite uh, his Excellency Ota Berzen um, Ambassador of uh, Georgia. Um, ambassador Ota has served uh, here in Korea for nearly four years now, and uh, he is soon leaving in the beginning of August. Uh, so probably uh, it's the uh, last visit of uh, his uh, to Korea University, or we can organize another event. Uh, but, uh, why don't you introduce your country briefly and also uh, your insights on the changing uh, geopolitics and geopolitical consolidation of uh, Georgia? Hello everybody, thank you so much. It's so interesting to be here, invited and uh, after the pandemic especially. Uh, 
because uh, this is not the first time, as Professor Hart mentioned, that I'm here and uh, representing my country and talking about the not only geopolitics, but about the Georgia for the relations and where we are standing and how the globe is small and what is our interest. But I would like to, first of all, use this opportunity and thank uh, Professor Park, Professor Lee, Professor Poole, uh, Dr. Yun, and students, first and foremost, as well, like, because it's very important, like, because that we are investing in the young generations to elevate the awareness and understanding who we are, how the situation are in the world, and that's why that we are, have been invited as an ambassador from the practical perspective to speak what is happening in the field and how we feel ourselves uh, to be uh, interested to you for the future perspectives of your professions and for your definition of the future. Now I will uh, continue Her Excellency's uh, uh, Maria's uh, uh, conversation of who, who we are, Georgia, and the world, and how why the Georgia matters, and why all of us will matter. And first of all, also I would like to express our wholehearted uh, solidarity to the Ukrainian brothers and sisters who are fighting today for our peace. For our, uh, I mean, it's our, not Georgian, but who are sitting in this room, all of us, the global peace and international rule-based order and United Nations Charter, OSCE, and so many other institutions who matter for all of us. Georgia is the country, the one of the oldest countries on the planet and the uh, youngest uh, after the collapse of USSR and Georgia with the, our Baltic uh, countries was one of the major triggers of the collapse of this brutal machine called the Soviet Union. And after this uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Georgia is passing uh, very difficult uh, pages of its history because it is a new modern country with a lot of external changes, especially coming from the Russian Federation to not see the success story uh, of uh, this uh, uh, near the neighborhood and to uh, expand its uh, sphere of the influences, what the uh, ambassador mentioned, and uh, uh, still thinking about dividing rule uh, ideas, uh, which is uh, a little bit old, but unfortunately it's uh, actual in this 21st century we are witnessing now in Ukraine. And as, uh, it's mentioned like that our aspirations to the European Union is not about the government, it's the choice of the people, and the majority of the Georgian population is supposed to the European and Euro-Atlantic integration since we declared our independence. And that's we are, what we are fighting for all these three decades, because that we are counting 30 years of the independence after the uh, collapse of the USSR. But uh, when it comes to the European Union, yes, there is a uh, Eastern partnership has been created and we are well coming closer and closer each day. And uh, Georgia is one of the uh, first runners, I think, uh, to come the closer to the European institution and its values and democracy. And uh, we are continuing to do so our best to reach uh, the, our ultimate goal to become the European member. And uh, what's happened, that there is a three associate trios, Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, who wants to be part of this uh, very important institution, which is called the European Union, and its uh, membership. And we have just recently, on the 9th, just yesterday, our Prime Minister passed a questionnaire uh, application to the uh, European Union uh, to uh, be part of this uh, very uh, honorable organization. And I think that this question is really very big uh, 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 work has been done by us, but of course it's, it's very important that like, the progress ahead of us, we should continue uh, part to the uh, Europeanization of the Georgia and to sectoral integration, first of all, which is very important, and connectivity as well. And I would like to mention that, uh, of course, that this Ukrainian war is not started just now, what we have been saying, but as the ambassador mentioned, that this Russian uh, aggression like it started in Georgia, like in 2008. And at that time, I could say very openly, like that the international community was not so vocal. Uh, uh, on these uh, issues, because as we've been saying that that was the trigger by the Kremlin, and uh, uh, this uh, Ukraine will be the next 
we've been saying like a bit uh, all the time, and unfortunately, it was uh, repeated in 2014 in Crimea, and after Crimea, what we have received, we received now the full-fledged invasion and war in the Ukrainian soil, so, and right now, while we are speaking, these people are fighting for their freedom and for our freedom as well. That's why that who is the closest and understandable what is happening, I think this is the Georgia, but who, who already witnessed on our skin, what does it mean having this five-day war with the Russian Federation? And uh, I think that uh, this is only our choice, like it, uh, uh, to be uh, looking for the Europe and uh, to be become the uh, member of the European Union and its institution. Also, just recently in the March, uh, that uh, there is a new uh, EU strategic compass has been issued, which is very interesting document. Like, and this document uh, very boldly says regarding the Eastern Partnership and Association Trio, and talking about the connectivity, Plexi security, and so on and so forth, and uh, new architecture of the European Union and its values. And uh, I think that we are there, we are very appreciating that these very bold uh, narratives about us and how they see the enlargement of the European Union and it should, uh, this is the response somehow like that, uh, for this brutal machine who is fighting for us uh, in our uh, part of the world and how the Professor Park mentioned like the yes, this is the global issue, not only locally, just we are having the war on this path. And uh, my country will do its utmost like that, to uh, achieve this ultimate goal and to become the Euro part of the European Union. I will stop here because I could speak about this issue <laughs> till tomorrow. It's better to put some words uh, uh, for the Q&A session. But also I would like to use this opportunity a little bit to mention uh, the Korea-Georgia relations, which is very important as well. Because uh, Georgia, as I said, we are a very young country, but we are part of the uh, uh, in interesting geopolitical uh, place. We are the crossroads of the Asia and Europe. And we are uh, surrounded by the big empires, like uh, Korea as well. And we have so many things in common, like uh, when it's, uh, we are reading our history pages, like, uh, and there is a lot of parallels could be made when we are talking about the Georgia and Korea relations, especially when it comes to the peace and long-lasting peace in the Korean Peninsula. And we are talking about the game with the peace in uh, Europe, in the heart of the Europe today. That means that so many things in common when it comes to the international relations and our agendas and our foreign policy priorities. But when it comes to our relations as well, it should be open market based and Georgia and uh, Korea, both of us, we are one of the top countries when it comes to the easing of doing business and when it comes to the uh, transparency, when it comes to the market trade. And I'm uh, talking with the numbers of the, this very honorable institution, World Bank and the IFC and IMF and so on and so forth. And I think that we could be the very interesting uh, pedestal for the Korea, um, uh, Korea itself, uh, uh, in terms of the doing businesses throughout the Georgia, rest of our region, because the rest of our region is very important for the Korean perspectives and Korean foreign policy priorities as well. And I think that we are, uh, we could be very interesting partner and crucial partner in this regard. And I think that what I'm doing as an ambassador just elevate the acknowledgement among the politicians, among the uh, uh, academia, among the uh, decision makers of the foreign policy, just how the Georgia could be useful in uh, for the Korean foreign policy or trade policy priorities in our part of the world, because the both of us were democracy, and the democracy is the major values, like that, how we could be uh, reliable to each other and how our partnership could be solid. And this year we are uh, celebrating 30 years of our diplomatic relations. A lot of things has been done, and I would like to use this opportunity, and Professor Hu, this, uh, he is not only uh, used to be the uh, former ambassador in Ukraine and conquering the Georgia, but he is wholeheartedly bringing the Korea in, uh, brought the Korea in our part of the world until today with his public diplomacy. He is making more than any other person that I met here like uh, in promoting our relations, not only about Georgia, about Korea, Georgia, Korea, Ukraine relations. Like, and I think that, thank you so much, Professor, because that, through you, we are opening the new windows and new horizons like, for the generations to come. 
And it's very important to have that type of gathering so I can exchange ideas and interact between each other. Thank you so much. I will stop here. I said the notice and I will pass the word to my uh, friend and colleague from the Latvia. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Ota. I'd like to give you more time uh, next, uh, in next occasion. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now invite uh, Professor Ari, uh, Ambassador Aris Vigans, um, Ambassador from Latvia. He's the youngest uh, in terms of uh, time of arrival to Korea. Uh, so, but uh, he is a very experienced uh, diplomat uh, from Latvia. And uh, we will talk about uh, Latvia a little bit and then uh, the uh, geopolitical constellations of your country. Please. Well, thank you so much for uh, invitation and for organizing uh, such a discussion and uh, also thanks to students for showing uh, your interest also in uh, whatever diplomats are uh, talking. And uh, I don't know where to start because uh, uh, my colleagues have been so uh, comprehensive but maybe I will try to, to touch uh, also some few aspects of uh, what I think it is also important to uh, um, to touch upon, but uh, but uh, so I'm I'm sorry if I'm going to sound a little bit chaotic, but uh, 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 starting with uh, European uh, the, the 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 theme of this uh, discussion, the European neighborhood policy. So Latvia, from the outset, from the very beginning, uh, uh, about joining the European Union was a strong advocate for European neighborhood policy and especially for Eastern Partnership uh, countries. And uh, uh, so we were willing to help uh, uh, those countries uh, with aspirations uh, to, um, to gain uh, uh, more experience uh, while promoting stability, uh, economic development, uh, good governance, rule of law, uh, as well as uh, human rights uh, through cooperation. And in our region, uh, we have gone through the difficult times and uh, we have gone through uh, uh, economy that was centrally planned to transition uh, to uh, market economy. And I think uh, Latvia, as well as other Baltic uh, states, uh, uh, experience is uh, quite valuable to our partners in uh, Eastern neighborhood. And uh, taking into account uh, this fact, uh, this was also uh, only natural that uh, uh, Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova was uh, one of the highest priorities for us to, to deliver also our experience uh, to them. And uh, we have been involved uh, quite a lot also in, in many different aspects of cooperation and uh, this is also, uh, this cooperation was very natural. Uh, it was uh, also uh, due to uh, our common understanding of uh, our uh, uh, history. Uh, we under uh, understand each other's cultures and also uh, uh, mentality. So I think that was a very natural uh, thing to have. So, um, but the reality is uh, different nowadays. I think we will touch upon uh, this aspect as well uh, just a little bit later, but uh, the reality with Russia uh, uh, being unpredictable, uh, international player, aggressive, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, confrontational uh, foreign policy, uh, disrespect for international uh, rules-based order, international agreements, and, and as well as uh, international commitments, it makes our uh, situation in, in international uh, arena, not only in Europe, but uh, globally, uh, very, very uh, challenging. So the same goes also for, uh, for uh, United Nations Security Council, uh, where one of the uh, uh, Security uh, Council uh, permanent members, uh, being Russia, uh, is acting uh, uh, like, it, uh, like it acts, and, and, uh, and also that brings uh, our attention to uh, 
um, sooner uh, reorganization of uh, United Nations and including United Nations uh, Security Council. Um, as, as you might know, uh, uh, Latvia gained its independence in 1918, uh, so it's uh, uh, 104 years ago. And uh, but uh, we were not able to enjoy our full independence like uh, many other European countries uh, for a long time because in 1939, on 23rd of August, uh, uh, Hitler and Stalin uh, concluded the non-aggression pact uh, between, which was signed uh, by uh, that time by foreign ministers of uh, Soviet Union, Vyacheslav uh, Molotov and, uh, and uh, uh, Nazi Germany side uh, Ribbentrop. And uh, so they have uh, decided the uh, future fate of uh, some European nations, uh, including the Baltic states. So they divided uh, Europe in uh, their um, spheres of influence, uh, which is actually, uh, I think, also uh, Russia's interest to still uh, do that uh, the same way as they did uh, during uh, Soviet Union times, that uh, they have some special interest, so and, uh, nobody uh, it has, uh, in that sense, a sovereign right for independence, territorial integrity, and uh, uh, in this uh, in this context, uh, uh, so when the, the, this uh, non-aggression pact was uh, signed, and, and uh, you might have uh, heard of history, then uh, in September uh, 1979, uh, Germany uh, invaded uh, Poland, and then uh, at the same time. Uh, uh, the fate of the Baltic states was already uh, made. Um, I will just I will try to be shorter in my historical discourse. Uh, but uh, uh, in 1940, uh, in fact, uh, when uh, uh, Nazi Germany, together with Italians, actually uh, 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 invaded uh, Paris, uh, uh, on the same uh, uh, days, on 17th of June, uh, Latvia was occupied by Soviet Union. Uh, so, uh, uh, then at uh, some a point later, uh, not to mention that uh, 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 Soviet uh, Russia or Soviet Union has imposed on uh, Baltic states uh, some kind of mutual uh, technical assistance uh, agreement uh, when uh, the military uh, could have been placed in, in uh, these, these, these territories. Uh, you know that the uh, uh, Soviet Union has uh, also offered similar agreement to Finland, but Finland refused, so they started the war with Finland. And uh, in, in this context, the uh, League of Nations uh, uh, has expelled the uh, Soviet Union out from uh, the, the predecessor of the uh, uh, United Nations. Uh, they expelled out of this organization. But, um, so uh, uh, after the Second World War started, uh, then after uh, Soviet Union's invasion and, and uh, uh, into the Baltic states, uh, uh, Nazi Germany invaded, uh, occupied uh, our territories, then again uh, Soviet Union after the Second World War ended uh, in 1945. Uh, actually, this is the, the the date, uh, 9th of May, which is actually the victory uh, day in, uh, in, uh, it, it was in Soviet Union and is still in Russia. Uh, this was also called during the Soviet times uh, kind of uh, victory day or uh, day of liberation. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, three Baltic states and other uh, countries in Europe has, uh, have lost uh, their independence. So after, uh, for around uh, 50 years, um, our countries were occupied, so uh, there was no liberation, and, uh, and this is uh, already another discourse. I, I think it's, uh, I don't want to go too much into details, but, but uh, due to our experience, uh, while regaining uh, our independence in 1990, uh, we haven't stopped experience uh, the same kind of politics 
uh, that was uh, realized by uh, uh, at that time Russia. It was very similar to Soviet uh, Union style policy. So uh, we were all the time uh, uh, being, uh, how to say, uh, criticized about our our uh, uh, our policies. Uh, about discrimination of uh, Russian-speaking, so-called Russian-speaking populations, and including uh, being called Nazis. And now I think every single uh, European country and also countries in the world can experience the same policy now being applied uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to other countries. And uh, now the the, the uh, recent recent. Uh, Recent example was that uh, uh, Russian uh, Russian propaganda is uh, saying that also Sweden uh, is being uh, can be Nazi Nazi uh, supporters. But uh, as you might know, that uh, Sweden and Finland is uh, contemplating uh, about joining NATO, and, and most probably they will apply for uh, joining NATO uh, during the summit uh, this June in Madrid. I have uh, many other things to to, uh, to add, uh, but uh, maybe I, I was uh, just just a little bit off topic. But uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, during discussions or there will be questions and answers, and I, I would be glad to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, last but not least, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Lee uh, to uh, focus more about the Korean perspective. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Spark, and, and, and I'm, I'm truly happy and privileged uh, to be a part of this wonderful meeting. Uh, I will briefly uh, talk about Korea and Northeast Asia. Uh, Korea is not a European neighbor, close neighbor, but I would say Korea is a close partner and good friend of a European counterpart. Well, uh, so I, I would naturally focus on, on, on the second part of, of today's uh, the title of today's meeting, Changing Geopolitics. So uh, the war in Ukraine uh, changed a lot of geopolitical landscape, but not just in Europe, but also in other parts of the world. The Korean Peninsula and East Asia is, may not be an exception. First, how Korea perceives this crisis? I would say we are surprised. We were surprised because we saw that open war has ended, at least in the post Cold War era. The use of force has ended in the post Cold War era. Sphere of influence might have been the word that was used in, in Yalta in 1945. But all of a sudden, clock was turning backward. And we are sometimes wondering whether we are, staying, well, whether we are living in the 1945 Yalta system, or 1975 Helsinki Final 1989 Collapse of the Berlin War, or 2009 Eastern expansion of the European Union. So all these historical footsteps are mixed as of today in 2022. So Korea is a country living that lived under a long geopolitical and security instability. We have North Korea division of the peninsula and North Korea is accelerating uh, the nuclear development and, and missile development. So uh, we, the threat perception, the threat perception has actually increased and economic effect of the war and economic effect of the sanction began to be felt also here in Korea. Energy price is going up, wheat price is going up, supply chains are changing and even the usual, the nighttime snack, the chickens and, and well, because the yeah, cooking oil price is also going up. So everything, uh, well, the economic impact began to be felt. But I 
uh, I, yeah, I'm taking the same step with the uh, ambassador, if it's different than this, that uh, sometimes we have to accept the price to pay for freedom. So we will not step back and then we will uh, to, to maintain a strong solidarity. Korea's position is, is quite clear. This is clear. Uh, in in the June, uh, sorry, in uh, in the May of foreign ministers meeting uh, last month, the uh, Korean foreign minister Jong Yeo, former foreign minister Jong Yeo, uh, announced that the, the war, this war, is a serious violation of the UN Charter, and Korea promised uh, the 40 million dollars humanitarian aid to Ukraine, and uh, also in addition to non Lethal uh, weaponry system and, and other supplies. So Korea is uh, standing with the other allies and partners. In fact, on North Korea, North Korea might have learned a lesson that having a nuclear weapon turned out to be a good choice because but North Korea, at least internally, would, would think that. Well, we are now seeing Ukraine giving up nuclear weapon and getting invaded. But as long as we have nuclear ICBMs, yeah, then nobody will invade us. They might think so, and uh, that is it is becoming an even bigger challenge for our first coming uh, negotiation, the denuclearization negotiation and peace building on the Korean Peninsula. So the challenge get bigger. Impact on China. Well, China can be either you know, may pick up some collective gain and collective loss. At least in the short run, China Russia relations will get strengthened because Russia needs a partner and to some degree the China can fill the gap, but China cannot fill the gap that the West the, the European Union, Korea and other the you other. Know, the global economy has provided. So it will be a different landscape, but uh, in the short run, China-Russia uh, relations will get strengthened. But uh, China, uh, to some degree, may want to keep a certain distance with, with Russia, because well, China is, is watching anxiously the sanction and may think one day the same kind of sanction could be applied to China, and Chinese economy is much more heavily engaged and intertwined with the world economy. So yeah, the, the impact will be a lot different. So uh, geopolitics is changing, and what is happening on one side of the Eurasian continent may not, well, it, it is directly, or, well, it, or, or at least even with, with the small time lag it is happening on the other side of the continent. So in that sense, Ukraine crisis it, it, well, is a tragic event, tragic crisis with two thumbs, two finger across. I hope yeah, it could be uh, end soon. But it also provided a very noble opportunity for Korea to rethink about its role in global security and and also the partnership with the European Union and European France. So today is day two of the new administration, the new administration, and uh, a lot of the, the new diplomatic the framework are, are being constituted and will be announced. And I do hope, I do hope, the Korea uh, could uh, could level up its engagement partnership, constructive partnership with the European conference. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Professor Lee, for keeping time, especially. Uh, now I'd like to open the floor uh, after the first round of uh, ambassador's in interventions, because uh, Ambassador Maria has to leave a little bit earlier than other uh, ambassadors. Uh, if you have any questions to Ma Ambassador Maria, please wait right away. Uh, 
probably then I'd like to uh, pick up the uh, one of the pre-submitted questions uh, to uh, directed to uh, Ambassador Maria. Uh, Maria Paula Villaverde, uh, is she here? Are you there? No. She uh, submitted uh, one uh, question uh, online and. Uh, not, not there, but the uh, question is quite in, uh, interesting. Uh, probably it's uh, suitable to ask uh, this question to you. But if you have any questions, uh, you can have uh, more questions. Yeah. Any questions to uh, Mr. Maria? <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Yeah, really. It's, uh, please identify yourself uh, briefly and then uh, ask question. Yes, hello, your excellencies, professors. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I am a last semester graduate student in GSI studying international development and cooperation. I'm from Romania, class in EU citizen myself, and my preliminary question actually was regarding what would be the implications of Ukraine uh, fast tracking into the European Union for Georgia and for Serbia. I mentioned Serbia because we're talking about the European neighborhood policy, and we know that the situation is quite delicate, and Serbia has neutrality in this whole Ukraine war. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, Sabina has uh, pre-submitted her question too, yes, right? Yeah. going to be treated at the same time as the one with Georgia and Moldova. So they will go think, hand in hand. We always go hand in hand. Uh, we went hand in hand with Portugal. Uh, there were uh, 10 European countries which went hand in hand. So it's, 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 it's normal. Um, uh, but each country also has its own path. Uh, perhaps sometimes, as you see at the end of the process, we wait for the others. Uh, if they, because each country has its own peculiarities, and uh, um, it is uh, important that you treat each country on their own, in a way. Um, so it, it is, uh, in terms of process, we put them together, but then in terms of negotiation, uh, each, can, each country is a candidate country when they become, and then they have their own uh, 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 discussions in bilateral, in bilateral way, because uh, each country has its own peculiarities, uh, its development is different, uh, uh, and, uh, and perhaps the, the accent in, in some of the different chapters uh, is, also, is also different. Uh, so um, uh, certainly perhaps uh, the moment is now important. I think uh, uh, it is, a, a, as Professor Lee mentioned, a, a big geopolitical and economic uh, um, uh, shift uh, in, 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 in the whole uh, world. Um, first, we are going to uh, um, um, continue helping Ukraine, uh, uh, supporting Ukraine and supporting Georgia, Moldova uh, the same way in case uh, there is an extension of, 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 of the conflict uh, to, to this, uh, these countries. Um, mainly uh, continue giving arms. I mean, we, we have talked that uh, when, when big crises come, then we, we do the impossible. And this is the first time that uh, the European Union has used uh, European funds to pay for weapons. This has something never occurred in the past, because the situation really is, is at a limit and, and uh, they need uh, weapons. So we are helping them with, with arms. We are helping them put in a lot of economic pressure to, to, to Russia and Belarus um, with economic sanctions, unprecedented economic sanctions, which are going to hurt and are hurting now. This has never been done before to, to, to block uh, you know, a country's reserve, national reserve bank. Uh, 
that has never happened before, uh, to go into strategic uh, sectors like energy, like transport, like aviation. Uh, uh, these are enormous uh, scientists that had enormous repercussion. When I was discussing here some days with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, they were well, telling them you should uh, do more and extend uh, your uh, ban and um, uh, uh, transport uh, flight ban uh, to, to the territory of, 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 of Russia. We don't want to see Korean um, uh, flights over Russia like we all have uh, uh, done. And they were they were telling me, oh, you know, uh, of course this is our business, uh, and and uh, it has been hard for for us to uh, to obtain those those rights. But uh, all has a cost. This sanction has an enormous cost for Romania, for Latvia, for, for Georgia, for us, European countries, enormous cost for Korean as well. So, but we are, this is the cost of freedom, my friends. <laughs> and I am not doing, saying his slogans. This is really a cost of freedom, as I said. So, and then I told them, you know, Korean companies, and at the end they have institutions because they had to stop by their own, not because they decided to stop, but because the insurance companies are not going to insure them if they go to Russia. So it has a, you know, even if you don't want to, you want to maintain, a, uh, you know, uh, your um, uh, uh, industry you know, with Russia, you will be because spare parts. You will not have spare parts to, 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 to use uh, to produce things in Russia. If you produce something from Russia, perhaps you cannot export it to Europe because uh, it has it has it has an impact. So so big sanctions that were, were done there that were not done before. But there is always diplomacy, and that comes to the question perhaps of Mario Paula. Diplomacy is always there. There is constant, well, apart from the negotiations between uh, Ukraine and Russia, the Europeans have, are trying uh, constantly to speak with, uh, with uh, President Putin, but there is no, no way to go anywhere for the moment. And, and diplomacy is always there. The door of diplomacy has always been there and should be also for Korean Peninsula. Uh, and for, for other crises. That's why we diplomats are here for, uh, to build those bridges, to allow the channels of communication to be, to be open. But we have to be also clear about the risk and the challenges that all this um, uh, poses. So we see more and more what we call a weaponization. Everything becomes a weapon. Trade becomes a weapon. Energy becomes a weapon. Wheat, cereals, uh, fertilizers becomes a weapon. Um, you know, Russia blocking the 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 the, the, the cereals, the boats, the, the ships full of cereals coming to other countries of the world. There will be a food crisis. The the the, the price of bread and uh, and and uh, and uh, fertilizers and and uh, sunflower and others is going to go rocket high. Uh, and these are essential part of the. Of the meat. This is like your rice, the Korean rice. We have the rice is the bread. Hmm? So we, we, uh, we are going to pay much more. Uh, but then that's it. So that's why, and you mentioned Otter very well, the strategic compounds. That is, that is our strategic defense, um, our defense strategy for Europe. That means that uh, we have to, uh, you will see more increasing of defense budget in many countries of the world, including Korea with the new government and because of the situation. But also we have to spend better. We have to spend defense budgets better together. Do uh, more joint defense projects uh, because we are, we are. It's our security which is at, at stake. Uh, but uh, mainly, um, what I wonder, and that's what I would like to say uh, for you to keep in mind, it's that we need to make the European model survive. This is about our European model, um, uh, which is for Europe uh, in a global world, which is uh, certainly political liberty, economic prosperity, and social cohesion. All of them combined. And we don't just you know, pick and choose one. You know, we have to have the three, and we have to combine them. We don't need to renounce to anything. Do we want to see a model based on these three pillars, or do we want to see a different model where you don't have economic, uh, political uh, liberties, where you have economic prosperity, but you don't have any social cohesion, or you want to have a model imposed by force and violence? I think this is what is at stake today, 
And uh, more than ever, it's important that you study the European model. Uh, because I think uh, we share with Korea a lot of values and, and, and principles which are part of this. Not only European model, it's a universal model. Uh, for Europeans, the universal human right uh, declaration is, is key to our construction. That's why it's very important that the countries that want to be part of Europe have fundamental rights and freedoms at the heart of what uh, they do. So, so that is the question I leave, you know, do we want a model uh, which is based on rule of law, multilateralism, solidarity. These are the principles we were celebrating on the 9th of May, uh, all of us in uh, Seoul Square. With, uh, with the public. That's what we wanted to, to convey. Um, this is the model what I think you are teaching here, uh, Professor Park, Professor Lee. Um, this is the model we want to share with Korea and like-minded partners. This is the model we need to defend. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Maria, for making it to Korea University, despite your very busy schedule. Uh, why don't you give her a big applause? Uh, <laughs> So please feel free to leave any time you want. Thank you. Uh, now let's uh, start our uh, second round of discussion. Uh, I have uh, here uh, the third uh, pre-submitted question, but uh, probably this can be uh, done uh, after we have uh, uh, another short round of uh, second uh, discussion. Right? So um, in. Reverse the order, uh, please, for uh, the Well, I, I would rather have a quick question uh, to the Ambassador uh, from Georgia, uh, Ambassador Bezinich, uh, uh, in two, well, we, we, the Russian invasion was what was, did this Ukraine invasion? Or well, was not a unique one. We have the, the case in Chechen, we have case in South Wales here, and, and we have the case in, in Crimea. But uh, somehow, somehow I, I'm, I'm feeling that the previous uh, conflict uh, in, in South Wales here, the Chechen, well, was gearing more heading toward a status quo of the system. But it seems like, yeah, the, the well, the recent case, recent war in Ukraine, showed that certainly that the expansionary nature, not defensive, but the expansionary nature of, of Russian foreign policy. So from the Georgian perspective, well, are you witnessing that Russian stance, Russian foreign policy is changing toward more kind of the expansionary side? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. Uh, I will describe in uh, this uh, from the outset. Let me do. First of all, uh, the Russian uh, foreign policy is based on imperialism, for sure. And uh, it's not about uh, only Georgia and Ukraine. I would like to a little bit uh, go. It's about uh, my country, 20% of territory occupied by the Russians. And after the collapse of the USSR, I would like to say that just very, uh, it's not about uh, that uh, the things change. Nothing has been changed. It's from the Kremlin perspective, it was all the same, like the sphere of the influence. Uh, the nearest neighborhood should be under the control of the Kremlin and uh, never respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the country surrounding them. And the, what I have mentioned, this is a divide and rule, like it is, you know, what was the, in the Tsarist Russian time, when it was the 200 years ago, when the Georgia and the Caucasus has been uh, incorporated to the uh, Russia at that time, and then we had a short-lived uh, independence that has been uh, declared in the 1918, uh, and the three years it was the first uh, Democratic Republic of Georgia for three years, and then we have then uh, under the occupation of the Soviet 
uh, army, the Red Army, and uh, since then we had the 70 years of the another occupation of the USSR, and we declared our independence. And it's not, it's never changed, and it's, uh, I don't think so that now is the time what we have been talking, that we should be united as much as we can. And uh, in 2008, nothing has started in 2008. It started way before, after the fall of the USSR. For instance, if you will pull out the, some interviews of the, just the Putin, you could see that how the what was in the Munich conference, what they said in 2006, that one of the biggest, biggest uh, mistakes of the geopolitical uh, order was the collapse of the USSR. He declared this uh, open in the Munich conference in 2006. Afterwards, the embargo has been put on Georgia, and the two uh, separatist movement has been uh, instigating against the Georgian central government. It was Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, because uh, for Russia it was uh, very important like, to, to keep uh, uh, fragile Georgia. Uh, till today, and fragile neighborhoods surrounding them in terms of the uh, control them. And uh, afterwards, we had an invasion in Georgia in 2010, full fledged invasion, I would like to say. And uh, with our Western partners, that we uh, kept Georgia survived, and but we lost the 20% of our territory is occupied by now. And uh, what we have been uh, saying at that time that is uh, Russia is not going to stop. And uh, once again, I would like to say that uh, in this auditorium and elsewhere, that uh, uh, it's uh, at that time the international community was not that vocal and was not uh, anticipating uh, the threat what the small Georgia was uh, telling uh, to the international community at that time. Our population is 3 million, 5, and we have uh, passed. Uh, very severe consequences, and today we are paying the biggest price for freedom, and uh, my country's uh, uh, security is on the stake. And that's why the that worry of the, in Ukraine is the same thing what is happening to us. And since then, in 2008, Russia stationed more than 10,000 military personnel in our occupied territories in terms of the uh, cover, and uh, not only Georgia, but to cover the uh, Iran and Turkey's uh, threats from uh, Georgian soil. And uh, it's uh, the military perspective. Uh, speaking like that, it was very important like to keep their military might in the Caucasus region. But it's not only about the Georgia, it's about the whole Caucasus region. Like it's about the Armenia, Azerbaijan, and some other countries keeping the Caucasus always uh, boiling um, spot in terms of the uh, uh, keeping uh, the central governments fragile and to not see prosperous. And why the, for the uh, Putin, the Georgia is the, one of the most uh, difficult uh, places because the Georgia's democratic will to become the European Union and the process of the uh, reforms uh, became the headache uh, for the Kremlin. And because that it could have the spillover to other post-Soviet spaces. And that was the one of the major things to hold Georgia accountable, like, and to keep under the influence of the Kremlin. And that the scenario continued in Ukraine. And now we see Moldova is under threat as well, like, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go in deeper, I think we could discuss this later, but I think I answered your question, I think. Thank you, Professor Lee and uh, Ambassador Ota. Um, Ambassador Aris, uh, you have uh, left a lot of points uh, due to time limitation. Uh, could you use uh, three to four minutes uh, to explore more things? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, uh, lots of the things uh, have been said by uh, by my colleague, also uh, the Georgian ambassador and also uh, EU ambassador. Um, so, the, what's next? What, what what we can do about the situation? It's it's really difficult. I think for academics and and uh, practitioners, diplomats, it's going to be a tough issue to uh, how to uh, how to get out of this situation. Uh, uh, if the apparent uh, international rules-based uh, order 
is not functioning at uh, at the level that everybody would be satisfied. So there are, there, there are some countries that uh, are willing to challenge this uh, situation. So uh, in in our context, uh, from the European Union side, the same goes for uh, our transatlantic partners from uh, from uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, U.S. and, and uh, Canada, I think uh, uh, as never before, uh, due to uh, Russia's unprovoked and uh, aggressive invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, Western, Western uh, alliance uh, has been united as never before. And I think this was a big mistake by, by uh, Russian or let's say Kremlin uh, authorities to think that uh, they will be able to uh, uh, kind of divide uh, our unity. So, uh, um, so sanctions have been imposed, uh, political, uh, financial, economic, trade, uh, military, uh, to isolate uh, Russia until the moment when uh, Russia stops uh, this, um, how to say, it's like to stop this war in, 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 in uh, Ukraine. Uh, since uh, uh, Georgian ambassador has mentioned it uh, several times about uh, uh, the Russian aggression uh, back in uh, on 8th of, 8th of August of uh, 2008 uh, that I have to mention that uh, that was a situation that uh, still I think uh, Western world I, I, I would like to uh, I, I will try to be frank about this but Western world still uh, the uh, some uh, European uh, Union countries and even the United States were kind of illus illusionary about uh, uh, prospects of uh, democratic uh, Russia uh, because uh, that was a change of uh, presidentship uh, in uh, in Russia that was uh, uh, Dmitry, Dmitry Medvedev who was uh, in power, and uh, and and uh, I must uh, say that uh, U.S. policy of restarting relations uh, with Russia was an, a, a bit, uh, uh, how to say, unsubstantiated. So I think uh, that kind of encouraged uh, Russia, uh, which understands only uh, strength, not weaknesses. It, it, it encouraged to such kind of uh, actions uh, that uh, uh, Georgia was invaded, and uh, and from our part, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, three Baltic states, and some other like-minded partners uh, were very uh, vocal or uh, very uh, uh, yes, I would say vocal uh, while speaking uh, with other. Uh, Western European allies uh, in uh, NATO uh, for giving this possibility for Georgia and uh, Ukraine to give a membership action plan within NATO and we were lobbying across uh, the world but uh, apparently some uh, some countries were not willing uh, to uh, su submit to that and uh, we have warned also uh, about not uh, having business as usual uh, with Russia after such an action. And I think if we would have stopped uh, Russia uh, at that time, might be that uh, Ukraine situation wouldn't uh, repeat, or it would be kind of much uh, different uh, situation nowadays. But it's hard to, uh, hard to uh, speculate on that. But. Uh, from our part, uh, as just uh, I, I failed to mention at the very beginning, uh, uh, I should say that the uh, Baltic region uh, feels pretty safe under the umbrella of uh, soft power European Union and uh, harder power defense uh, alliance of North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and uh, also uh, uh, that uh, taking into account that Russia is now 
uh, more involved in Ukraine, so they don't have any any other uh, uh, other capacities to kind of uh, try to threaten our part of the world. But at the same time, uh, we are not. Uh, uh, we are aware of this uh, situation, we are vigilant and we are uh, preparing ourselves for uh, uh, whatever scenario and uh, so is uh, also our partners in, uh, in uh, NATO and the uh, European Union. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Ambassador Ota, last intervention for one, two minutes. On the same topic? Yeah. Or whatever you want to add. Okay. I, think, uh, I think, thank you so much, uh, Alice, like a bit, uh, describing. I think that we are only to make the, you know, some kind of natural from, uh, from the story is that, that uh, we should respect the uh, rule based international order. And that's what I'm, we are working uh, day and night here with our Korean counterparts that besides the geographical distances, the values matters. And values matters. Even today is more important like, to be closer and closer together and uh, to shoulder to shoulder to defend what has been uh, unite all of us. But like, it doesn't matter the size of the nation. Like, it matters the values, it matters the democracy, it matters the freedom. And that's uh, what we are here fighting for. And that's what we are doing as an ambassador, like uh, speaking and explaining and with the academia and with the executive and the legislative branches by working and elevating the acknowledgement between each other. And I think that uh, this Ukraine uh, war, uh, I think is really in Asia, like uh, they've elevated, elevated a lot. And I think that uh, we will do our outcomes, especially with this uh, new administration, like uh, that, uh, uh, we'll understand more in the core principles and we could defend each other in the international forum, especially the United Nations and to be uh, and the other institutions, respecting institutions that we could defend each other and defend the rule based international order. Thank you, Professor. Um, yes, uh, uh, Professor Ho, uh, former ambassador of Korea to Ukraine, uh, has some words. Uh, as I uh, was introduced, I uh, worked as ambassador to Georgia and also in Moldova. Mm -hmm. So 16 years ago, uh, if I, our country anticipated this kind of current situation, it was a great insight. It was a great honor for me to work for these countries. These three countries have now great uh, security concerns, but one good uh, stimulation from this tra tragic words is uh, the integration process to European Union will be speed up. Uh, speed up. So, I don't know. Because the European country should, uh, should be ready to uh, accept these countries. And one great uh, change is that so far, the European people just had a debate. We are Europeans. We are the borderline of Europe. This year, uh, in Bangkok, in the geographical forms. But uh, I think they changed uh, this geographic oriented uh, perspective uh, to more, more uh, value oriented uh, perspective. So democratic values is much more important. And the Georgia is fully just uh, qualified in this terms to become one of the European countries. Also, after this war, uh, Ukraine and the world war, just uh, they will be qualified uh, for European membership. Thank you, you Ambassador. Um, is it your Mr. Kim dong -yang, student of uh, CIS, College of International Studies, uh, he has put uh, two questions, but one is very relevant and is uh, not discussed yet. So if he is there, I'd like to give him uh, this opportunity to uh, ask a question. Kim dong -yang? No? Then uh, uh, why don't you ask uh, one last question, uh, because Anders have to leave. Uh, in five minutes, 
So uh, I like to invite uh, any student to have uh, uh, the last question or two. It's a really rare opportunity. Helen, uh, please. First of all, I want to thank the Hisakogosis and professors for sharing their minds on a very sensitive issue now. And I would like to ask that since when talking our topic is European neighborhood policy, but when talking about European security, I think that we cannot leave out the membership of NATO as well. And I believe that Georgia is also a promised member of NATO. And I wanted to ask if the earlier submission application of EU membership recently could also do believe it would facilitate the joining of the NATO membership as well. Thank you. This is different. This is different processes, but but I would like to say that Georgia is the one of the biggest contributors of the non NATO countries. Okay, we are the part of the all the ISAF operations and in Afghanistan and Iraq is and our military reform is uh, very very uh, integrated to the standards of the. Uh, uh, NATO standards, and uh, I think that among these three countries which we are talking about, I think that Georgia is the front line when it comes to the NATO membership, because that, uh, our uh, in the per capita, uh, when we are talking about the uh, NATO, we are the in the world the first country who contributed for the security and peace elsewhere in the world. And we are not only uh, working with the ISAF operations by the NATO plus, we are uh, with the European <coughs> Union, we are standing in the Central Africa and uh, other places as well. Which means that we are not only uh, requesting the security, but we are the, one of the major contributors in, of the set uh, load of security as well. That means that uh, we are there. Uh, just we are waiting for this very historic momentum uh, because my country really stands ready uh, of the uh, aspirations of the North Atlantic uh, organizations and the European Union as well. But this is different, different processes. Okay? The application in the European Union is different and the NATO is different. But definitely we are very much looking and focus on the Madrid uh, summit which is going to come very soon. And we have very big hopes, okay, because in the 2008, in the Bucharest summit, it has been said that the NATO and Ukraine will become one baby members of this alliance. That's what we are trying and doing our outputs and our reforms in this dimension are irreversible. Irreversible. And daily basis, we are trying ourselves like, to approximate all our institutions and reforms close. Uh, to the final decisions in this video. Many thanks. Um, probably we have the, the very last question. Please. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Nuha and I'm a PhD student here in Korea University. Um, I listened very attentively to all the, the discussions and it made me think a lot. So first of all, um, when you were uh, talking about how the same strategies that were used by Stalin before are, are used now, and namely the, the Nazi accusation and um, other strategies like that, I was thinking about what went wrong exactly in the European model for this situation to happen. And then I, I kept thinking that the, one of the justification of the Russian leadership was that um, uh, they uh, referred to the UN Charter and the right to self-defense. So I was thinking if it, whether it means or not that there is a limitation in the European model and if it is a chance for incremental changes or modifications because as mentioned as well during the discussion, um, there were some exceptions that were made in the way that the, the EU responded. Um, uh, and I, we can see that some behavior 
um, are changing compared to the, the immediate post war, for example, Germany offering to provide weapons. So I was just wondering if today is a situation that calls for reform, or on the contrary, holding on more to the to the basis of what the European model stands for. Thank you. We have a very, very deep uh, question, like that one is the European member country, and another we are the, trying to be the applicant country, which is the totally different uh, dimensions in this regard. But I would try to, uh, from our perspective, like to, uh, uh, it, uh, now, as I mentioned, like that we should read the uh, new uh, EU strategic compass which uh, has been dramatically changed since its uh, draft version from the last year because of uh, this Ukrainian war uh, dramatically changed the geopolitical situation in the world. We have these, these dimensions as well. And uh, new security architecture is narrating. And new foreign policy prior priorities are, uh, I think, uh, Professor Lee could uh, uh, Add a little bit uh, to all of us, like this. Uh, we are witnessing like a new uh, trajectory of the foreign policy dimensions around the world. No matter we are in Asia or uh, Europe or the United States or everywhere, like, because the security architecture, what was working till today, is on the state. And it should be changed. Definitely, it should be changed. And so many things are happening, like. Uh, if we will uh, cross uh, right now uh, on the wall, like this, the Ukrainian war, there's so many alliances like this, and not about only NATO, we can uh, put touch the issue of the Quad here, and so on and so forth, and we could go in this debate till the tomorrow morning. So many things, but still, as uh, Ambassador Ari mentioned, like this, still, this is the very big question now, like this. Uh, how uh, we are going to hit in the nearest future, and what could be the solution to keep this international rules-based uh, order? This is the big question, and uh, I cannot tell you in two words what to do of this outcome, but all the academia, all the executives, the legislations, and who are working on the foreign policy priorities, this is, this is the issue right now that uh, security architecture, what was uh, working till today, uh, working then, it's, it's changed. It's changing and it must change. It must change. And definitely the United Nations, like the Security Council, everything, everything like that is on the state because that we see the, how the Security Council permanent member innovates uh, destroying, uh, destroying everything like uh, what is on the United Nations Charter, uh, and it's unpredictable. With, with its uh, even uh, being the partner, reliable partner, and or anything else like uh, that. That means that everything is upside down in some way. And to be super, uh, now we have the real world uh, on our globe, and definitely it will bring the consequences, and it, it, will, it will bring the new. Uh, realities uh, for really all of us, like, and that's what we are looking for. Thank you, Ambassadors. Uh, it's a really pity that uh, we have not enough time for this kind of uh, big discussion. My recommendation to students uh, is if you have uh, big questions, be the first to ask so that uh, you have more time to uh, get answers from the prominence. Right? Yes, yes. We need more time for answering this question. Right? So, ladies and gentlemen, it was a really very, very uh, good opportunity uh, for us all to have a discussion with uh, prominent uh, uh, ambassadors from Europe and also a uh, professor from Korea University. Um, I really appreciate your time uh, to make it uh, to Korea University. And uh, uh, Ambassador Ota, um, if uh, your time allows, probably we could have another occasion to invite you to the campus. 
and, uh, and also Aris, you know, is um, really not the first time, uh, not the only time uh, you come to Korea University campus, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we can give uh, gentlemen uh, big hands, right? To